Jim Chalmers. Yes, I'm here. Um, <laughs> Jim Chalmers. Shout out Trisha. Yeah, I was wondering what they're doing. Welcome they're doing to Bus call, Life, Pete. It's a roll call every morning. The yeah. fun thing about the roll call is you work out who's not on the bus after we've left. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And that was Sky's Jonathan Lee juggling the morning roll call with a live TV cross from the ALP bus. But two days later, Labor's campaign hit a traffic jam as the leader and a handful of travelling journalists went down with COVID-19, thus offering a gift to headline writers in Perth and Melbourne. Alba Sneezy. Albo Queasy. The Herald Sun then asked readers if Albo having COVID could affect Labor's chances at the election and produced this brilliant pie chart showing a resounding yes. Except, as you can see, 65% actually said no. Whoops. And by the way, there is a P in party. And while Sky After Dark hosts wish Albo all the best, the memo did not make it to Herald Sun columnist Caleb Bond, who told Peter Krellin... This is a great opportunity <laughs> for the Labor Party to hide away Anthony Albanese. You know, after his shock a week last week, great chance to just put him away in a basement somewhere, as you say. But it's probably the best thing that could have happened to this campaign for Labor. And it seems Bond was onto something, with Labor's Jason Clare replacing his boss at the leader's press conference next day and shooting the lights out. It means that the campaign's going to be a little bit different over the, over the course of the next few days. Hang on, hang on a sec. Um, Elections are usually pretty presidential. You know, you see one candidate against the other. Over the course of the next week, you're going to see something different. You're going to see our team. Yeah. Claire's 28-minute press conference was so impressive that by the end, he was being asked by Jonathan Lee. You've come in today and you've been comfortable, nuanced and on message. Are you not the Labor leader that many people have been looking for? <laughs> And shortly after that, the Australian was running a story on how Albanese's stand-in had ignited Labor's base. And sure enough, on Twitter and on Facebook, the comments on Claire were super positive. This guy is brilliant and natural. Charismatic Claire. Wow. Now that is a true leader. And adding even more spice was the Daily Mail, which gushed. Anthony Albanese is upstaged by his handsome and articulate replacement after testing positive to COVID. More Jason, less Albo. Amazing, isn't it? Because Jason Clare is Labor's official campaign spokesman, which means he's been out and about in the media, but no one seems to have noticed. The warm response to Clare's performance was a far cry from Albo's supposed reception at the Byron Bay Blues Festival, or as the commercial media dubbed it. Turning the Byron Bay Blues Fest into a boo fest. When blues fest became booze fest. The blues fest turned into a boo fest. And on the ABC's 7pm news, it was all booze too. Receiving a different reception to the one he got at last night's Byron Bay Blues Fest. The opposition leader being booed certainly fitted with the media narrative of a gaff-prone leader. But was it fair? The Sevens Mark Riley went on to say, but the others did not. A sour note competing with equally loud cheers after the majority gave him a rock star's welcome. So, boos and cheers and a rock star welcome. And what about the first and so far only leaders' debate on Sky News, which had Albo voted a narrow winner by the audience, despite another dodgy graphic? And did the Daily Telegraph's front page cheer at the people's verdict? Mm, not exactly. Albo's all at sea. ALP leader trips again over boats. And uh, Sky's Paul Murray was also reluctant to acknowledge an Albo victory, declaring before the debate kicked off... Put simply, my view on this is that if Albo uh, wins by uh, anything less than 10 uh, in the room, then that's a problem for Albo. Which, if you do the numbers, means he reckons Albanese lost. But more important than who won was who was actually watching. And on that count, there were cheers all round, with Sky calling it the highest rating debate in Sky News Australia history. According to News Corp, more than 415,000 people watched across Sky TV and its digital platforms. But it's still a long way from the glory days of TV debates when panels of journalists held leaders to the fire in hugely popular primetime contests. For one night only, the foxy morons were left for dead while the singing youth were left in droves. Last night's ratings belonged to two bespectacled men in suits, toe-to-toe -to -toe in the Great Hall. Back in those days, we also had the controversial Dancing Worm to tell us who was winning. 
I corrected your improper use of that OECD report and talking about 11 years doesn't alter the fact that you were trying to mislead the Australian public. Mr Howard, your officials are represented in the OECD. If there was a grave no, problem no, no, with it, I would have thought they would pathetic. have put forward additional information to the OECD. No, that's pathetic. Those debates were simulcast across multiple networks in prime Sunday night slots and watched by millions. So, are our leaders now hiding on pay TV to avoid the glare of voters? Perhaps, but Sky has a format that allows voters to ask the questions and both campaigns want to keep Sky on side. As former News Corp political reporter Malcolm Farr, a veteran of these debates, told us... You do have to wonder what sort of leverage was employed to ensure that Sky News got the debate. It certainly wasn't because of the incredible reach. So, with three weeks to go and Albanese in a seven-day lock-up, will there be more debates? Well, the ABC is pushing hard for a clash to be hosted by David Spears. I do think it's important for them to do something that's available for all to see you know, on free-to-air. I, I think that's, that's critically important in an election campaign. And Nine and Seven are also chasing their own TV showdown. And certainly before the election, both leaders were talking a big game. Will you do a debate, though? Of course I will. Club? Of course I will. We'll be debating lots. I'm up for a debate on... ABC, 7, 9, 10, Herald, West, you can all host, Guardian, everyone can host one. I'll, I'll, turn up, I'll turn up wherever they are. But the days of big rating TV events are probably over anyway. As Malcolm Farr told Media Watch. At the moment, I don't think there's any particular excitement from both leaders. It's not as if it's a Keating Howard contest. You've got two rather flat and stylised leaders. If you're a network executive, can you imagine chucking the voice to put on a debate? Short answer to that is no. But let's leave the election campaign for now and go to an incredible rescue in the Northern Rivers floods, which set social media alight and had radio hosts gasping with amazement. She single-handedly saved a family. This story will blow you away. Oh, that's amazing. What an amazing story. Wow, yeah, Lisa. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Lisa is Lisa Parks, an iron woman, fitness coach and well-known contestant on Nine's Ninja Warrior. I'm Lisa Parks, I'm 43 years old and I'm from the beautiful Byron Bay. And on 28th of February, as the Northern Rivers was hit by the area's worst ever floods, she joined the community rescue effort and single-handedly saved a family. Lisa's story of daring do in the hinterland above Mullumbimby filled the entire front page of the Saturday paper on March the 12th. And it really was a heroic tale. I could see a baby lying on top of the mud and about 30 metres or 50 metres away, the parents, the mum and dad, were buried almost neck deep in the mud and they had been there for more than 24 hours and couldn't move their arms. Parks told the paper's Rick Morton she had waded for hours through waist-deep water to the isolated community of Upper Main Arm and had come upon a landslide. Then, hearing a baby cry, she'd tied a rope to a tree and abseiled down. And as she told the Saturday paper, she was just in the nick of time. The baby must have been at that age, about eight months, and it was impeccable timing because it tried to roll over and had caught mud in its mouth and became unconscious. Yes, crying one moment, unconscious the next. Cue Ninja Warrior to the rescue. So I had to clear its airways and resuscitate that baby in the middle of a landslide while hanging from a rope, which I did. Amazing stuff. And her next job? Free the parents. We'd called triple zero by this time and a helicopter was coming. Apparently I was like a dog at the beach with the speed I was trying to dig those parents out. Thanks to Lisa's bravery and skills, everything turned out well because the chopper then arrived and evacuated the trio. As Parks told the paper... The family was flown to Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane where they are now fine. Lisa's story was shared on Twitter to hundreds of thousands of people and it was picked up overseas by the UK's Daily Star and the UK's independent. Trapped baby rescued just moments before swallowing mud and passing out. Parks also retold her tale to ABC Radio, who ran it around the country, and to WSFM's Jonesy and Amanda, who were just blown away. So the parents were, were powerless? Were they uh, stuck in the mud? Yeah, they cool. were um, chest, deep in, chest deep in mud. Um, but they, they were out and breathing, but obviously, I don't know how long they'd been there, probably 24 hours, like their people were saying. Um, but they couldn't reach their baby. 
No, they couldn't reach the baby. So and so could you got up there. So their arms were stuck. Through. Their yeah, arms were stuck in the mud, and their baby was on top of the mud, and they couldn't Man, get to it. If you didn't it. come along, that could have. That, that could have. Oh, that's amazing! What an amazing story! Wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah. But Parks' story, which was one of several really remarkable rescues, raised a number of questions, such as why did the Saturday paper not get confirmation from the family, who must have been so grateful, or from the doctors who helped save the baby's life, or from the chopper crew who came down through the clouds and trees and plucked the unnamed family off the mud. After all, the story was true, wasn't it? I mean, the paper did actually make some checks, didn't it? Seems not. Because the New South Wales Ambulance Service told MediaWatch they have no record of Parks's triple zero call. New South Wales Police also told MediaWatch they could find no trace. Numerous rescue helicopter services told us they had no record of a baby being airlifted from Upper Main Arm. And the Queensland Children's Hospital in Brisbane was unable to find any case that matched Lisa Parks' description. What's more, no one in the local community seems to know the family that Parks supposedly rescued. So, we asked Lisa Parks why none of the details checked out. After telling us she didn't want a hero's story and had already spoken to MediaWatch, which wasn't correct, she eventually answered our emailed questions and spoke to us over the phone. She insisted her story was true, but admitted... I have no evidence to back up my story. Sorry. I got a child and its parents. I don't know who they are. I don't know the hospital or if there was a helicopter. I've been in a lot of shock and trauma as well. We also asked the Saturday paper what checks, if any, it had made on Lisa's story. The editor told MediaWatch it had a team of meticulous fact-checkers and... Before publication, the Saturday paper was able to verify that Lisa Parks was providing rescue assistance in Upper Main Arm Valley. Our reporter spoke to a person who was with her that day and verified pictures from the day. But the reporter got no confirmation of the miraculous rescue. And following concerns raised by a reader, the paper has removed Lisa's story from the article and scrapped the headline, saying it was not able to verify all aspects of the story to a satisfactory level. Or, as it admitted in a statement to MediaWatch, it has been unable to prove that it happened. But this is not the first time the media has failed to verify one of Lisa's stories. In 2017, Nine's Ninja Warrior told viewers that Parks was a miracle mum who had fought her way back to health after six months of rehab after a terrible car crash. It's driving along and someone came straight through a red light and just smashed into my car. You wouldn't even think anyone would have walked out alive of that car. I broke my back. I was paralysed. I just laid there going, I'm never going to walk again. Parks told Nine Honey she'd been 19 and living in South Africa when the crash occurred. And looking at her VW Beetle, you can see how lucky she must have been. But there's one small problem. That is not her car. It's a stock image. And as the caption makes clear, and the photographer has confirmed, it is not from South Africa. Crashed Volkswagen Beetle wrapped round a lamppost on the roadside between Rio de Janeiro and Parachi, Brazil. That is 7,000 kilometres away from Johannesburg. And, given that it's not her crash, should Nine have been so ready to accept her heroic tale of recovery? Six months in rehab, I had to learn to walk properly again. To be able to do what I do now, people would never believe that someone that's had a broken back and been that severely injured could actually do that. But it is possible. Possible, no doubt. But how can we be sure? Parks told us... The accident happened in 1991. I did have a beetle, it did get wrapped around a telegraph pole, and I did break my back. I never claimed that was my photo. The person who made my audition video got footage and used images. I don't know from where. We asked Lisa Parks if she had any evidence. Pictures, witnesses, a hospital, a doctor, anything that could confirm her story, which may well be true. But she told MediaWatch she had nothing. We also asked Nine if they were aware the VW picture was not her car. They were not. Nine has now removed the image from its online story. And you can read full statements from Nine, the Saturday paper, Lisa Parks and Emergency Services on our website. And finally tonight, to Nine News Adelaide and a story about a hot air balloon making an emergency landing. As Mimi Becker reports, all 12 passengers on board were not seriously injured. It may be some months before answers are known as to why this balloon had to make a crash landing. Oh dear. 
And with the news feed frozen, Nine News Adelaide had to make an emergency landing too. First by playing 10 minutes of ads, then by showing a lifestyle program, Hello SA. And then come 6pm, Nine News Adelaide did the unthinkable and broadcast Melbourne's news instead. This is Melbourne's Nine News with Peter Hitchener. And for the next hour, viewers in South Australia were treated to news that... Victorians won't have to be double-dosed or QR code check-in at pubs, cafes and restaurants. And a story about the opening of an ancient Greek exhibition at the Melbourne Museum. And if Adelaide viewers weren't seeing red by then, there was also the horror of the Victorian weather. Around town, Yarra Glen was our coldest spot overnight with a low of five. Unsurprisingly, Adelaideans were furious, taking to Nine's Facebook page in droves. I thought we had all been transported into the Socialist Republic of Victoria. Please God, come back soon. Watching the news from Melbourne is painful. You can stick your Melbourne news up where the sun don't shine. This is Adelaide. Take that, Melbourne. But viewers could breathe a sigh of relief when the local newsreader came back later to explain and apologise. Well, you probably noticed, unfortunately, we couldn't air our 6pm bulletin tonight due to major technical issues. But we'll be back as usual tomorrow. Thanks for your patience and understanding. That's all from us for tonight. There's more on our website where you can stream or download the program. And don't forget, Media Bites every Thursday. But for now until next week, goodbye. <laughs>